Hi, this is Christopher Perrin, and welcome to this episode of The Christopher Perrin Show. It's a podcast that's part of the truenorth.fm podcast network. You can also read articles that are often along the same lines as what I, what I record at christopherperrin.substack.com. And I have a number of lectures recorded on classicalu.com. In a previous episode, I talked about the way we often pile on learning and subjects in our classical schools, much the way as our progressive and modern schools do. And I argued that it was kind of a, a remnant of, of uh, the modern way of doing education that's still present in our classical schools. Well, in this particular episode, I want to mention another, another challenge for us, and that's the way we fragment learning by cutting, cutting up liberal arts into subjects and too many subjects. And so this is a version of an article I've written called Cutting School, Why Classical Schools Fragment Education and Turn Learning into Subjects. And you can find that at christopherperrin.substack.com. In 2012, British author and speaker Ken Robinson delivered a speech at the Richmond Forum on revolutionizing education in America. After hearing his presentation, a student in the audience asked him a question along these lines. Do you think it wise for us to integrate our studies across the disciplines, he asked. And Sir Robinson's response was that the world is already integrated. It's we who have disintegrated it. I love the way he turned common thinking about education on its head with such a comment. The world, with all of its fascinating variety from bubbles, why are they always spherical, to elephants, is already an integrated whole. In our mad drive to break things down and apart, we have lost sight of the wholeness of things. The word analysis, from the Greek analuen, is to loosen or dissolve or to pull things apart. It's the word we use for breaking things down into their constituent parts. Now, analysis is good. We do need to study the various parts of an engine, a molecule, or the human body. But a study of the parts alone is never sufficient without remembering that the parts, well, are part of something. A piston ring is interesting. A metal block that contains a string of countless explosions involving the pistons and the piston rings. That's the internal combustion engine. That is astonishing. The world used to be called a cosmos, one great, big, beautiful ornament or an arranged harmony. It was often compared to an organism, something living, something vital. The cosmos was an enchanted whole existing for a purpose and containing various integrated elements, all moving toward ends according to their essence and design. Put another way, everything that existed had a cause, a cause for its form and a cause for its purpose or end. Nothing was a mere brute fact. All things were coordinated and going somewhere. Aristotle was the first to really think about this and write about it. And now there are many who dispute this. But this is the way the world used to be understood. It was going somewhere. Things had an end, a telos, a purpose. We have sanitized the living cosmos, even sterilized it. And it seems the most we can do with a purposeless world is to cut it up into pieces for careful examination. This began to happen in earnest during the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, studying the material of things and, for many, becoming convinced there was nothing beyond the material. We sought to put nature on the rack, as Bacon said, and to extract her secrets. But let me give credit. We did learn a thing or two from the deep study of material reality. And its study does give merit and reward. With the telescope and the microscope, we saw things we had never seen before. We were astonished to discover so many more parts to our world that our unaided human eyes could ever see. And the great scientists like Kepler, Galileo, Niels Bohr, etc., expected that these new parts were in fact ordered, that they in fact did have purposes and ends, even if they were kept in secret for centuries. In fact, most of these seminal scientists assumed an invisible order behind the material order they observed. They studied matter deeply without becoming materialists. 
So I don't, anyway, reject the deep study of material reality. I only reject the premise that material reality is a dead reality. I do not reject examining the various parts of the whole, but analysis need not become an autopsy. The world derives its life from its divine origin. Once that is rejected, analysis will become a lopsided parsing of the world with no vivifying unity. With no unity in the cosmos, we will have no unity in education. No more genuine universities where the many verses are folded into the one, from the Latin unus, one, and versus, which means toward, facing, or turning. Instead, we get fragmented departments and various subjects, and often they don't talk very well with one another. Our common current vocabulary does single, our breakup. Our world is fragmented, and therefore so are our schools, studies, and terms. A fragmented school is not unified. It is therefore weak. It is therefore fragile. In Latin, frangere, or frangere means to break. Fragmentum means something broken, and fragilis means brittle, fragile, fleeting. The Latin simply reminds us of the connection between breaking up and breaking down. Our word college used to signal a collection of scholars who gathered to read. See the word lectio in our word collection. Lectio meaning reading. And look how we used to teach a common curriculum. Now the word does not suggest that we do. We are left with traditional educational words like university, college, liberal arts, grammar, logic, rhetoric that have become squishy and vague, connoting something revered and cloudy from a past we have only recently forgotten. Contemporary colleges working out the latest expression of our reigning American ideas of materialistic relativism, pragmatism, skepticism, and pluralism are split and fragmented, likely beyond the possibility of unification. Departments and majors have multiplied. Fields of studies have proliferated, and one can get a graduate degree in areas of study that even 20 years ago would have been considered bizarre and beyond serious academic inquiry. When there is no unity, there is also no criteria for what is academic or non-academic, for what is excellent or lacking excellence. Without unity, the implications for learning follow logical lines. Why should Shakespeare be considered greater greater writings than, say, the vampire diaries? Why shouldn't we study tree climbing, getting dressed in the morning, Lady Lady Gaga and the sociology of fame, or how to watch television? Colleges can do and offer such courses now and usually without any sense of irony. Those are actual course titles from legitimate universities. Here's the rub. American high schools have been designed to prepare students for what our college and universities have become. The trends on our college campuses become the curricula of our high schools. Classical schools want to return to the studies of a common canon of the great ideas and the books that contain them. Modern high schools want to and need to make students ready for modern colleges that don't any longer have a canon. Classical schools are working hard to remember what we have forgotten and to remember that we have forgotten and have been trying to do so for about 40 years now. It turns out that remembering is hard. It turns out that what was forgotten over two or three generations is not recovered in a single decade. We've been doing a good work recovering the classical trivium first, and then the classical quadrivium, second, while slowly learning to integrate learning and study across the curriculum and cultivate a vibrant culture, third. The work has begun and it's well underway. We have not yet, however, come to terms with the way that time and space are ordered in our schools. Our schools are generally drab, pedestrian, and pragmatic in design. That is to say, they look and function like virtually any other modern school. This is not surprising, nor is it really even a criticism. We have been formed in these kinds of schools, and our blindness is only healed gradually. So we can be kind to ourselves. We can be patient with ourselves. 
Now, however, there are many who are seeing our school buildings and our schedules for what they really are, modern and progressive. By the way, what should a school look like? Well, my recommendation is to visit a monastery or any of the colleges at Oxford. I recommend that you build a school around a garden. The ordering of time and space matters, and it matters deeply. We are embodied creatures, and our five senses are very good qualities indeed. I will leave behind concerns about our school space and architecture, though these are related dynamically to our use of time and space, to focus at this point on the fragmentation of time. And I would just note at this moment that there are a couple of books you might want to look at. One is called Making School Beautiful by John Skillen who has thought about how schools can be designed physically to be beautiful and to order space. And then The Festive School, published and written by Nathan Carr, about returning joy, celebration, and liturgy to our school routines and rhythms. Both of these are published by Classical Academic Press, and I highly recommend them. We might say that our buildings are cut up in ugly ways. Well, so is time cut up. In ugly ways. We cut up time into seven or eight 50 minute periods with a brief 20 minute lunch period crammed in the middle. Now, your school may have a 30 minute lunch period, but measure the amount of time that students actually get to spend eating, and it will be significantly less. Most classical schools follow this pattern as an inherited educational norm, like we've inherited norms for grading. The way we grade is typically the way modern schools grade. Most classical schools are just beginning to question these practices. Thus, however, we are left with periods and sections. Even these words connote the science of dividing rather than unifying or harmonizing. Secare in Latin means to cut, and indeed we cut our way through education. Our word period suggests a small unit of time after which we definitely have to stop. That's what's at the root of that word. In our class sections and periods, we know that we take a small cut at something and then stop in short order, often just when things are warming up. Our learning is periodic. We constantly start and stop. We cut learning short. We sell learning short. It is no surprise that many American students are inclined to cut classes or cut school altogether. They want to do what we do to them. We cut school. They cut school. There is an irony here because classical schools know that learning should be integrated and seek to integrate subjects and to integrate faith and learning. You might remember that a whole number in math is called an integer. Both integer and integrity come from the Latin root, the same Latin root, integer, literally meaning untouched and thus something that is unimpaired, undivided, or whole. Learning should be holistic, for if Ken Robinson is right, the world lies before us already whole and integrated. But even to call our courses of study subjects can be problematic. The word subject has a legitimate use as a generic word for any directed matter of study. It is similar to words like theme, a general conception running through a composition of some kind, and topic, often meaning a more specific idea treated in a section of a composition or speech. The reason I think we've grown comfortable with the word subject to refer to our courses of study is that we have so widened our curriculum that it can include just about anything. Thus, we need to use adjectives to further modify subjects. We have traditional subjects, literary subjects, mathematical subjects, vocational subjects, technological subjects, classical subjects, linguistic subjects, and so on. We used to study the liberal arts and the four traditional sciences, natural science, moral or human science, philosophical science, and theological science. That's what we used to do. There was a time when virtually all that we studied was either an art or a science and with a clear idea of the difference between the two. The word subject originally meant something thrown beneath, as something thrown before you for your examination and consideration. Now virtually anything can be thrown at our feet, and virtually anything is in our modern schools and colleges. 
Virtually anything one encounters can be a subject, possibly even configured into a four-year degree. While we cut up the curriculum, we find that the curriculum has become a pie as big as the moon. So we must press on with our cutting, as there is so very much to divide. I know the words section, period, and subject are here to stay and can be used without causing cancer. Still, what if we use some older words instead? Consider the following words from our educational tradition. Art. Art from ars artis, which means skill, craft, craftsmanship. This is the fitting word for any of the seven liberal arts. Each liberal art is a study in verbal or mathematical skills that can find application in any human study or enterprise, or dare we say, subject. Art can also be applied to the fine arts that connote something we make or fashion that is an end. Finis means end, an end in itself. Or the word science, science from scientia, something known, knowledge. Any collected organized body of knowledge can be called a science. In this sense, biology and chemistry are sciences, but so can philosophy and theology be regarded as collected organized bodies of knowledge and thus sciences. We use our training in the liberal arts to classify, collect, categorize, arrange, and organize a science. The liberal arts enable us to create sciences. Or the word discipline from disciplina, which means learning, teaching, instruction, training, habits, discipline. A discipula is a student or learner engaged in a discipline. Or the word form from forma, which means shape, idea, kind, model, pattern. The British refer to their grades as forms. Courses from cursus, a passage, journey, or course. This word connotes that we together are heading in the same direction towards an appointed end. Or the word session derived from sedere, to sit. A session is a gathering in which we all come together and sit down, usually at the table, to learn. Seminar from seminarium, a nursery or seed plot. This is a place for exploration, discovery, planting, and growing seeds. Often the seminar is conducted around a table. Symposium, a Greek word that means literally with a drink. This generally connotes a larger gathering of mature learners who gather for discussion, usually hearing from several presenters or lecturers, and why not with a good cup of coffee or a glass of wine. Conventiculum. Literally a coming together, this Latin word can also designate a place as well as an activity and may be smaller in scope than a convention. And then there is convention, a coming together, that generally will involve a large number of people. Conference, literally a bringing together, often with a small number of people who gather to discuss a given topic. Can we not have a symposium, a seminar, a session, a course, a form? Can we not have a conference at our school? Or how about a colloquium, literally from a word that means a gathering to talk or discuss, usually on a designated topic. Any class that is dedicated to discussing a particular topic could be called a colloquium, and the plural is colloquia. Or tutorial, a class in which a tutor guides and instructs either an individual or a small group of students, or a forum. This Latin word means marketplace. A forum today is a gathering for the purpose of discussing questions, often with a larger group and possibly in a public setting, like the marketplace was. How about a workshop, a seminar or discussion group that emphasizes the exchange of ideas surrounding a particular art and demonstration of a technique or skill? Or how about the word studio? from studium, which means study, zeal, or fondness for something. Could not we have various kinds of studios? Or disputation from disputatio, discussion, debate, dispute, a traditional word for a debate in which a resolution or claim is disputed by two parties following a moderated and formal pattern of exchange and maybe with questions from a larger group or audience. Or declamation from declamatio, a practice in public speaking, an oratorical exercise. This is a traditional word for a set speech prepared on a theme in which a persuasive counsel is given for resolving a dilemma and adopting a wise course of action. Could we not host a declamatio in our schools? A declamation or oration, 
should we recover this word from oratio, a speaking, a speech, a discourse? This is a traditional general term for a prepared speech. After contemplating all of these old words above, some of which are still in use, why do today's classical schools, like progressive schools, still fragment the curriculum, still cut up school? The answer is simply because classical schools have been busy working on other pressing matters, even pressing priorities. We've been working on re-implementing the seven liberal arts and the natural sciences and the great books. That's a huge task. We've been working on cultivating a culture of wonder and delight. So perhaps it's somewhat understandable why we haven't yet got to addressing the way we cut up school. Over the last 30 years, many of us have questioned what we have found in our progressive educations, but only recently have we been we begun to question the wide sectioned cut up curriculum. To be honest, at first many of us did not have the eyes to see it. I certainly did not. Yes, we changed or substituted the subjects. We brought in Latin, logic, and rhetoric, but we still called them subjects and treated them as such. It turns out they are not so many subjects among a sea of other subjects. It turns out they are the arts that cultivate humans to be the fullest versions of themselves. It turns out they are the occasion and setting for mentorship, formation, and friendship. Perhaps they are holy places where we learn to love the true, good, and beautiful. They are not mere subjects. Now, however, it seems time to dedicate our full attention to the matter of putting back together the pieces of our fragmented curriculum. Just how we might do this will have to be the subject of another episode and article on reunifying our classical curriculum. And I will attempt to do that in the weeks to come. In the meantime, I welcome your ideas, thoughts, and criticisms. And thank you once again for viewing or listening to The Christopher Perrin Show. This article can be found at christopherperrin.substack.com if you want to read it. Thanks so much. I'd like to thank you for watching or listening to The Christopher Perrin Show. And to do that, I can give you a coupon code that will give you 10% off on anything that you might care to order at classicalacademicpress.com. And the coupon code is simply CPSHOW. Thanks again for listening or watching.